In this video, I have the pleasure of interviewing Nate Rossity, who is the founder of Stratascratch, which is a platform for preparing for your coding interview in data science. In the podcast, we talked about how Nate got into data science from a bioengineering background, how he then transitioned through various roles in marketing, and based on his senior roles as a data scientist and also as a founder of the Stratascratch platform, we also talked about the essential skill sets of a data scientist that recruiters are looking for. And we also explored some areas that aspiring data scientists are having trouble in and also recommendations on how to tackle those areas. And before diving into the podcast, let's have a brief introduction about Nate's background. So Nate has a bachelor's in bioengineering and a PhD in biomedical engineering. Upon graduation, Nate worked through various roles, initially as a data analyst, then as a co-founder of a company. He's also a senior manager in marketing analytics and strategy at an international biotech company. And in the data community, we know him as the founder of Stratus Scratch. And so without further ado, we're starting right now. All right, Nate, thanks for coming to the podcast on the Data Professor YouTube channel. Uh, so normally we would begin by the guests introducing themselves. So Nate, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I am Nate. Um, I am a full-time product strategist, uh, manager, and analytics um, at a biotech company. Um, and then I am also an adjunct professor teaching business analytics at a local university where I live. Um, and I'm also the co-founder of Stratascratch. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So let's start with like a basic question. Like how did you get into data? Uh, yeah. So I got into data specifically just through for my formal education in, um, you know, undergrad, I was uh, majoring in bioengineering. So th there's a huge data math statistics component there. Um, but I didn't really get into, um, I would say, like data and coding until graduate school. So I did a, a PhD in biomedical engineering, uh, focusing specifically on um, neuroscience as well as applied physics. So a lot of imaging um, sort of, you know, research that I did. Um, and that's where I got a lot of my uh, formal data and coding experience. Um, and then... And then I was a data scientist for many years um, and like that chunk of my time through various companies in my career, like really helped shape, you know, how to apply uh, data science um, and, and coding to data problems in industry. So it's very different than academia, but um, that's where I got a lot of my experience. Right. Yeah. And how, how much coding were you doing during your grad school? Yeah, every day. I was doing maybe 40 hours of coding every every wow. day. It was um my lab was it's a great like balance of like wet lab work. And so like mm -hmm. what I mean by wet lab work is um, you know, just um live experiments and then that you would actually get your hands dirty, uh deal with chemicals, deal with um, you know, your test subjects in my in my lab, it was like mice and rats and rodents, which is very, you know, common in, in that world. Mm -hmm. Um and so I did we did those experiments, we would capture a lot of um, images and a lot of data. Um, and I would take that and, and I would just run analyses on that to see if I could, you know, get a signal out of everything that I've captured. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So like most of the like uh, familiarity of the aspiring data scientists is to uh, maybe use like an existing data set or another would be like to perform like some form of web scraping to mm -hmm. to collect data or perform survey. So what what you were doing during your PhD is very unique in that you actually you know like collected data from live animals, uh, mouse, mice, and then you use that data for research. And then like the data that you have got after your analysis, did that kind of like drive your uh, experimental approach as well? Was it, like data driven <clears throat> the loop? Yeah, it, it was definitely a loop. Um, yeah, so what you know, what I did kind of day to day is I would do an experiment and then I would capture all of the data. I would then, um, you obviously have a hypothesis, right? And um, you're trying to figure out how to analyze the data in a certain way based off of your hypothesis. And so at that time, mm -hmm. there was never, there wasn't like a, 
like an industry or a term called data science. That didn't exist. Uh, so that kind of dates me a little bit. But mm -hmm. like data science actually existed back in the day. It just wasn't called data science. And um, there weren't like Python libraries where you can just call and say like run this sort of model, right, on your data. And then mm -hmm. it would just be a black box and you, would, you could just run it and see your output. But you know, I you you would have to basically write everything from scratch, write all the algorithms from scratch. And that was the hard part. But I think mm -hmm. that was what made data science so difficult. Um, and the people that really I felt like really spent years uh, building models from scratch really learned um, the math and the statistics behind it. And I think that was the most important thing that I learned. So yes, I coded for like a, like a lot of uh, hours, um, like 40 hours a week, but it was really just building these models and maybe like reading papers on how like a lot of other models were implemented and then using that. So like I actually used a lot, what's really kind of interesting, I used a lot of Hollywood uh, models. So um, mm -hmm. just straight from like, um, like studios where they did a lot of CGI stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I would I would take their models, I would apply it to like my images that I've collected on mice, um, and then I would try to figure out, you know, um, using using the those algorithms, try to figure out like um, a signal from the data that way. Um, mm -hmm. So it was just I thought it was really interesting, um, and then I would take that output, see what I got out of it. And that would inform me of my next set of experience, uh, experiments, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. that was me basically doing work um, um, and doing that loop for about five years. Uh, so like oh. I, I probably um, went through hundreds of mice um, and, mm -hmm. and just, yeah, five years of experiments, uh, tweaking things, uh, running the analysis, tweaking my analysis, and then doing another set of experiments to to just gradually improve and get something out um, right. over the years. Yeah, and uh, w w which programming language did you use for that? Yeah, it was uh, it was MATLAB. I don't know. Do you oh, know right. that? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah uh, MATLAB. Yeah, Python was not a big thing back in the day. Uh, I would say R was R was kind of big, but just not maybe not in my academic realm. People mm -hmm. really preferred MATLAB, but now right. like. Right. Not that many people use it. Um, I think you know, like the SAS and the MATLAB world is mm -hmm. kind of they're kind of going down a little bit because uh, mm -hmm. it costs a lot. Their licensing right. fees are like hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. Um, yeah. Whereas R and Python, they have a great community, um, great mm -hmm. libraries that have been like well vetted and tested out in industry. And so I think I think and it's free, and I think people like it. Right. Yeah, I would remember like we bought a license for MATLAB and then we had to plug in this like USB dongle in, it, in order for the program to run. Oh like, my for, God. Like, stuff. <laughs> oh, we didn't have that. We might, yeah, but yeah, but it's like that type of stuff. I feel yeah. like it's just not user friendly, you know? And, mm. um, but I, I didn't see why they would do it, why they would need it uh, to really, um, support the the building of the platform and keeping it mm -hmm. at a higher standard at a high standard because right. it mm -hmm. was a really good um really good like programming language and platform to to right. run your analyses on yeah yeah awesome yeah so there was like matlab and like what simul or something like that right simul link yeah there was a yeah. few, like jump is another one that still is used today mm -hmm. Um, yeah, there was, there was a lot, uh, kind of like the mm -hmm. standards people would use. Um, and so awesome. what was nice is like, you, you kind of knew the libraries that they used, um, and the mm -hmm. platforms mm -hmm. that they used. And so when you had to run your experiments, you, you could, you could, you would want to use their platforms so that you, you know, you're like, you're analyzing things in the exact same way. Right. And right. I think, mm -hmm. I think even in this day and age, it's the same thing. Like when you're running mm -hmm. our, uh, libraries and you you know another person runs the same one like you want to match things mm -hmm. um very much in similar ways because you want to match their outputs right yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah like like i have a similar experience like like one of my co-advisor my phd co-advisor so he uses matlab and so like and then we bought a, like a matlab license in order to you know reuse his code and then afterward like when I graduated and became a professor, and then like one of the graduate students, uh, he uses 
Python. And so I, I had to learn Python in order to match their uh, the work that they're doing. Oh, it's yeah. Similar, similar stuff, yeah. Similar cool. stuff, yeah. So you had to learn Py like a completely new language just to... Right. Yeah, that's tough. That is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so like after you graduated your PhD, so what did you do afterwards? Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, I I struggled with that uh, for a while um, as I was graduating my last year. Um, because as a grad student, uh, you can like the the default career path is like a tenure track professor, sort of like what you are, right? So you so you go to a postdoc and then you would apply to become a professor, and then hopefully you you go from assistant to associate professor, you get that tenure. Um, it is tough. Like I'm not mm -hmm. smart enough to actually do that. Uh, I just like when when I look at the students that were in my lab and in my department, like. I just didn't think that I would be able to survive another uh, one or two postdocs and then six years to get tenure. Um, so um, I learned what management consulting was. I didn't know anything about it uh, until like they started recruiting at my at my campus. So then, mm -hmm. so I'm like, okay, I'll give this a try. I don't really know exactly what it is, but I mean, they were hiring a ton of PhDs, and so I got I got. Um, I became a management consultant for about two years. Um, I learned the like the business side of things uh, in the healthcare uh, world. Like my clients were healthcare uh, and biotech and pharma companies. Uh, so I learned like you know sort of what what are their problems in the business side of things and what do they care about and how do they actually want us to solve their problems. And a lot mm -hmm. of it was analytical. It just wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. data science. Like they're not asking mm -hmm. us to build models or anything like that. Uh, at least in Python, they're asking you to build models, but like in Excel, which is completely different you know, at oh, that yeah. time. Um, yeah. I, I did about two years of that. Uh, it's a really tough life, like work balance wise. And then I uh, ended up um, starting a company with a friend of mine that was finishing up his postdoc actually. Um, and we started a, a company that was trying to add a uh, pricing transparency in the healthcare world, in the, uh, mm -hmm. the medical world. Like when you, in the US at least, if you go to the doctors, you have no idea what that bill is gonna be until you mm -hmm. get the bill three months later. And most people are mm -hmm. just like really shocked at how high the price is. So we try to add pricing transparency to that. Um, so that was our little startup uh, at that time. We ran it for about three years, maybe four years, but a good chunk of time uh, where I was leading more of like the, the engineering. So it was like full stack engineering that I had to learn. And then I was able to like have a team behind that uh, and then I did the product. So it was just um, business decisions, meeting engineering priorities and resourcing. Uh, and then I did sales and marketing. I did a little bit of everything. And then once that got, uh, when that, once that's fit, that was finished, um, I, I went into another healthcare, health tech company, and I was a data scientist for about three years. And then I am now at... Um, and then I went and um, am at the company I am right now. It's a international biotech pharma company. Um, and I started as a data scientist, um, really going through cl medical claims data, um, just various um, kind of third party, third vendor data um, and analyzing a lot of that. And then um, over time, they gradually like shifted me to the business side of things. And that's where I am now. It's more of a, uh, product strategy and analytics type of role that I have right now. Right. So more or less like using data to drive action. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and it's a lot of really cool use cases that my team uh, use in terms of like using data to drive action. So there's, there's mm -hmm. simple things, right? Like just trying to under, understand like the patient population that we're trying to serve um, mm -hmm. and, and like, um, trying to identify these patients and trying to uh, get in front of them, trying to like better understand their behavior. So a lot of that stuff, uh, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of data science and analytics behind trying to analyze, you know, like billions and billions of rows of data and the infrastructure that you would need to be able to do that to right. even like building machine learning models to predict when a patient is actually going to uh, be diagnosed with a disease. So we've mm -hmm. developed models here where like 
based off of medical claims data, we're able to understand like, okay, th this is the disease progression of this patient. Like, I think we should, um, um, I, I think there's an opportunity here to really help this hospital or help this payer, help this patient. So um, mm -hmm. that's sort of like what a lot of, not just my company, but a lot of other companies try to do. Um, mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of where we're where a lot of the industry is going now, right? Yeah, and like, how, like for the first time when you went into industry uh, as opposed to academia, what's the shift? Yeah, uh, the shift. For you? Yeah, uh, I would say there's several things. One is much faster pace uh, in industry. Mm -hmm. Like my meetings are like 30 minute meetings, right? You go in, mm -hmm. you talk a little bit, and then you move on to the next meeting, the next, not even the next, just not even the next, like, yeah, it's the next meeting, but it's also the next project and the next thing that you mm -hmm. need to do. So it's just much faster pace. Um, and like, there's a line of sight to what your goal is and uh, what you need to do. It's much more like translational that way, like where, where it's, it's real. Uh, and I'm not saying like academic is not real, but I like for me as a grad student, I I spent like three years exploring, right? It's very much unstructured time to just mm -hmm. kind of explore. Like you have a hypothesis, you want to explore whether or not it's true, whether or not you see something there. Um, and, and I did a lot of basic science too, where it's not like you don't, there's not like revenue, like I'm not trying to make money, right? I'm trying to really right. understand the mechanisms of what's going on um, in the brain. That was kind of like my dissertation project was a lot of neuroscience projects. So I was trying to understand like the mechanisms there, but there's no like ultimate goal of like making a drug or making mm -hmm. money in any way. It was just to learn. And that's, so it's that's why. Right? Yeah. What was that? It Was it like an open-ended project? Yeah. So it was an you open figure, like you want to close whenever you want or. Exactly. Right. Like you want to just learn and explore what is out there. And then when you think there's something to actually, th that you've actually learned something worth writing about, you then like set up a, a set of experiments that will really tease it out a little bit uh, better than just, you know, unstructured exploration. And then that's where, how papers are kind of written and born. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's very different. It's very different. And I wouldn't say I prefer one or the other. I mean, it's mm -hmm. really, I think it's based on personality. Um, it's really based off where you are in your life as well. Um, so yeah, I, it, both worlds are really, um, mm -hmm. um, I would say intellectually engaging. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very, uh, like, like amongst the guests. So your, your, your background is very unique. So you have a balance between both academia and also industry. And then like you, you've been through several roles, like from data science, data analyst to product manager, management. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very unique path. And and also we're, we're also getting there is how did you start your own company for um, the, the data, the strata scratch? Oh, for Strata Scratch, yeah, yeah. Scratch, yeah. yeah. So How did that came to be. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So no, but to your first point, yeah, it's a really. I have a very unique path that I think, like when you look at my LinkedIn profile or you you hear me talk about it, like if I look back, it totally makes mm -hmm. sense. Like I can see kind of like where I was kind of. Th these are the stepping stones of my career path of, in my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, but like, as I was moving forward though, like I didn't know what I was doing. I was just kind of picking the next stage or the next uh, part of my life based off of like what I just found interesting is all. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so, but about the Strata Scratch um, um, kind of story, I, like I said in the, in the beginning, I was a data scientist uh, for a few years across many different companies. Um, and so that meant that I had to like interview a lot at these companies um, and really trying to um, try to really understand where they're coming from. Because most of the time as, as data scientists interview, it's not like we don't have the skills, right? I mean, like the coding stuff, like we, we understand, we just need to polish off a little bit. Um, a lot of the product case questions, we can just like polish and refresh, but we have the skills. 
Um, and so I just needed to find platforms and, and like uh, maybe books out there that could really uh, talk about the interview process. So it's to me, it's very much like uh, studying for standardized testing, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. in the US for SATs. Like I know the material, but I need to know how the tests are, are like conducted and given because I'm studying for the test. I'm not studying right. the material. Um, right. And so... And so that's kind of like how Strategic Scratch was born in that I couldn't find a really good platform. The standards mm -hmm. out there at that time were LeetCode, uh, mm -hmm. which are algorithms, and they have mm -hmm. a few questions on databases, but the databases right. were not questions for data science. So mm -hmm. I'm basically studying off a platform designed for software engineers. And that's mm -hmm. not necessarily like great, but it was the only the best thing I had at that time. And then I think the second one was like Hacker Rank, which, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I didn't necessarily like that much. I just kind of used uh, on and off. Uh, so I don't really have too much to say about it. But really, like what I did uh, to prepare for those interviews was I went through Glassdoor questions mm -hmm. and just copy and pasted it onto like a like a Word document and just try to answer it. Right. But I had no idea whether or not, like, especially for the coding ones, whether or not my answer was right, because I didn't have like a, a database to execute the SQL queries off of or Python queries mm -hmm. off of. So I was, you know, I was just basically like, you know, somebody needs to create something like this, like a resource, at least on the coding side. So mm -hmm. um, you can have real questions from interviews from companies um, and they need to be data science oriented. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's probably the, the, the thing that is lacking for most platforms is that it's, it's not, it's not like data science oriented. And so what I mean by that is like in any data science question, there's a lot of nuances and a lot of assumptions that you need to mm -hmm. clarify first before you start coding. It's not like um, a quite an algorithm or a leak code question, which is like, sort this array from you know highest to lowest or something like that right or mm -hmm. find the duplicate numbers that's very black and white but like in the data science question it's it's very much um how you interpret it and then that mm -hmm. leads to um the the solution or it leads to the code and there's no platform out there that did that so i just i just tried to create that um and since then like i got a lot of i just asked users what they really wanted Mm -hmm. um, and I built that and then um, it just kind of grew over time. Like I started this in 2017 um, as like just a small little project that I would do on the side. But I really, what I did is about a year ago, maybe 13 months ago, I released the um, the real first version of Strata Scratch. And I think that's mm -hmm. like completely like rehauled everything, just yeah. optimized in terms of, um, performance and then a completely different UI. And it just kind of like people just seem to like it and it just, you know, has been growing ever since. Yeah. That's so I, I haven't so stopped doing it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I, I actually went to the website a few days ago and it looks really great. Yeah. The UI is very attractive. Oh, no. Thank you. Yeah. We spent yeah, a lot of yeah. time on that. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's, we're going to rehaul it again. I think. Um, I always I always try to engage with the community as much as I can, right? And, um, right. and I just I, what I'm always trying to do is like tell me what you want, um, and mm -hmm. I will try to build it. Uh, and a lot yes. of it is, you know, like the UI stuff changed it a little bit just mm -hmm. to make it a little sleeker. But a lot of it is like they're asking, uh, you know, Stratus guys, they're asking me like how do we think about these types of problems? Like, can you educate me on like statistics and probability questions? Can, can you have, do you have an opinion on how to structure um, uh, product sense questions, business case questions? Um, and then how do you think about um, the coding questions? Like, how do you approach mm -hmm. it? How do you like tease out the assumptions and things like that? Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot from the community. I learned what's lacking as well. Um, and mm -hmm. so yeah, at, at Strash Scratch, we're just really trying to um, educate as much as possible and and to just push out as much content as possible for, for everyone. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it, for Strata Scratch, so the platform is containing, like, it's a database of interview questions related to data science, right? And yeah. And, like, you would have explanation for that? Yeah. So right now for the coding questions, we do, we have the, 
what is it called? The, the solutions. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have solutions from other users, those that have actually mm -hmm. gotten the, the, um, the output correct, the same output that we got. Mm -hmm. uh, but right. because there's so many Another ways way. to code, right? We have, mm -hmm. they have maybe more optimal ways that, that mm -hmm. we have, or uh, they just thought about it differently and, and coded mm -hmm. it up differently. So we have that. Uh, so you can use those, if you can read code really well, you can use those as explanations. Uh, but mm -hmm. then we have this like really engaged um, community forum where uh, myself and I have several like team members that will go in and answer any questions users have about like how to actually, um, you know, approach these questions and get to right. a solution. And then we we're right now trying to really um, answer uh, and create solutions for the non-coding section which is mm -hmm. what i was uh, saying about like product sense questions statistics probability machine mm -hmm. learning those types of questions um right. but it's it's really tough because mm -hmm. i don't i don't necessarily want to answer every single interview question out there because as you can imagine there's hundreds if not thousands mm -hmm. but and as you can also imagine there's different answers every it, there's no right or wrong answers uh, answer for a lot of these mm -hmm. so um we're we're trying to figure out a way to get the community involved to also get uh answers and just really crowdsource things yeah wow. yeah that's a great term crowdsourcing yeah 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 yeah, yeah so um um, I mean, if, if you're able to share, like, how how is the user base for Stratus Scratch now? Yeah, we're so we're getting about, I want to say, like, this month's metrics, closing in at, like, 4,000 new users every month that we get. Wow. Um, okay. And so we've gone, uh, just in this year alone, uh, we've gone maybe, like, or not this year, the trailing uh, 12 months, um, about 30,000 users. So it's just mm -hmm. kind of just grown uh, quite a mm -hmm. bit since the earlier days of like 2017 to 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. yeah. And so a lot. Stratus Crash does it have like a free tier or is it paid? Yeah, no, no, it's both. We have a free tier. So I actually try okay. to, um, I try to make maybe like we have a database of about uh, 600 coding questions. Mm -hmm. I make about 50 right. of them free at any time. Mm -hmm. And then I rotate through the free ones as well. So uh -huh. um, if you come back like, you know, three months later or whatnot, you might see a few more or different free questions. Uh, mm -hmm. But then the paid tier is uh, like access to like the, the six, all 600 coding questions that we have right. with solutions for SQL and Python and the, mm -hmm. and the ability to really engage with the community. And then uh, mm -hmm. if you have any questions, my team or I will come in and help you with the question. Um, right. And then right now, all 400 some non-coding questions are all free. But mm -hmm. the only caveat there is just not every single question has an answer because we haven't gone right. we haven't gone there yet to to be able to do mm -hmm. it. Uh, but really, like, and then what I do is I try to produce content uh, where, like, if you've seen my YouTube channel, I'm basically talking through the approach of uh, how I would actually code up uh, solutions mm -hmm. to coding right. questions, and then I write um, at least like. I don't know, like five to 10 blog articles a month on the Strata Scratch blog to also give an under, like um, just an understanding of how to approach these questions. Mm -hmm. So I try to keep a lot of things as technical as possible. Um, and I want to give away as much free content as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and the, what one other thing is even those, you know, uh, all 600 coding questions, the vast majority of them, you can actually still code and and run your code uh, off of the database. I'm not mm -hmm. ever gonna stop anybody from really doing that. Um, it's really like the only thing you're really paying for, I guess, is like to validate your solution with my solution. That's it. That okay. You're paying for a button that does that. And you're probably also paying to uh, see uh, user solutions, like how other people have done it. So like mm -hmm. access to the community is kind of what you're paying for. Right. Um, but that's really it. Yeah. My goal is also always to kind of like push out as much free stuff as I can. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. And I mean, I mean, it's a great way to refresh as well. Um, as well as for those who are like preparing for their interview. And I mean, I, I would believe that the, the cost that they would incur 
for being a member of Strata Scratch, uh, would, would pay itself off in, in you know, like maybe in, in a couple of days if they got hired, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I try to actually, I'm probably the one of, I actually, two things, I guess, like I, I try to price myself at the standard or a li- even a little bit lower because mm-hmm. of what you mentioned. Um, just trying, if you get a job, you pay for it automatically. Right. But, right. um, but even then I also know, I, I try to do like price parity as much as possible. Uh, mm-hmm. so if you're from like certain countries that, that like, you know, the U S dollar is just very, like very strong and you might not mm-hmm. be able to afford it, or it's like too much of a jump to afford it. Mm-hmm. There's always like discount codes at the top, mm-hmm. uh, based off of your, the country you come from. Uh, mm-hmm. and then you can always apply the discount there. So, mm-hmm. you know, we want to make it, we understand that like the U S dollar is not, it's very strong for a lot of other com- mm-hmm. uh, countries. And so we want to, right make it even for as for people as much as possible yeah right and are you expanding internationally like are you like localizing your content in another language perhaps like maybe translating the the answer solutions to another language like chinese japanese yeah no that's a good question like i'm not um and i don't even know yeah i haven't i haven't even thought of that yeah, just uh, I haven't gotten any request to do it or anything. But if people people want that, you know, like I could definitely look into it, like these translational mm-hmm. uh, services that would do something like right. that. The only mm-hmm. language we are expanding into are more coding languages. Like we're going to okay, do R right. and like different database engines and things like that. But mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I mean, I was about to ask you about content creation. So you, you mentioned briefly about that. So maybe could mm-hmm. we dive in a bit? Like, what inspired you to become a YouTuber as well? As so, so this is probably your fourth endeavor, right? So for one, you're working full time um, in in product management. Um, second is you started Strata Scratch, mm-hmm. and what, what uh, was the professor, uh, adjunct professor? You are an adjunct yeah. professor, yeah, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And then also you are a YouTuber as well. Yeah, right? yeah. You so the YouTube, so content creation, yeah, as a as a whole. Uh, but yeah, I'll I'll focus on YouTube. So uh, mm-hmm. YouTube for me, it was really a function of trying to do marketing for Strata Scratch. Really, like mm-hmm. I, I, um, I'm just not a good marketer. And I don't really know um, really what it takes to to do a good job marketing like you, the product or whatever it is. But I know YouTube is uh, has a great data science community. Um, and so what I wanted to do was make videos and just kind of offer like free advice uh, to people and to educate them as much as possible based off of my opinions and what I've seen um, through my career. And so that's that's kind of like what I did. And I started doing uh, one video a week. Now it's really hard to keep up with that. Um, mm-hmm. So I, it's gone down to maybe like one one video every other week. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm still trying to do create the content as much as possible. But when I think of content as a whole, even outside of YouTube, you know, like I think of uh, like, for me, I like to write. And so Mm -hmm. um, it's easier for me to write and get my thoughts down than it is for me to uh, create YouTube videos because it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm not like a great, like personality on, (laughs) on the screen or anything like that. And like off the cuff, I I'm terrible at talking. I, in my mm-hmm. opinion. So I like to write. And so I, that's why like, I try to write as much as possible. You know, like I mentioned before, five to 10 blogs a month uh, mm-hmm. that, I, that I write. And um, I also try to write like not only technical things, but just like opinion articles on mm-hmm. like, you know, p- like my career or my reflections as a data scientist um, mm-hmm. through the various stages from like being very junior to mm-hmm. more senior, to to like you know life after data science type type of uh, material, so I try to like I sway towards more of the technical stuff, but I do try to sprinkle in like some of my mm-hmm. reflections back to when I was a data scientist and more mid career. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's what, how I think about data science. I I mean, sorry, that's how I think about marketing. I don't mm-hmm. think about it in 
any other way except to just push out educational material for people. Mm -hmm. And if people find it um, helpful, I'm glad to write more. If people don't like it, I'm glad to also just shut up and not not write or do any more videos. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's really up to everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're constantly like adapting to the uh, audience's feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Like even right now, like I have a Trello board. This is kind of how I do my work. Also, mm -hmm. like I, mm -hmm. I'm kind of, I just try to organize as much as possible. But I have, um, it's July right now. I have content uh, queued up. Uh, content topics queued up until uh, November already. So wow. that's about 30 topics that I already have identified that I want to write about. And then mm -hmm. I will just, you know, um, I have deadlines on each one. I'll pick a topic and I'll write about it and then I'll publish it um, on YouTube mm -hmm. or on my blog. Um, and so that's how I think about it also. Um, and based off of the comments I see in YouTube, based off of what mm -hmm. people tell me on my blog, I, I adjust the content accordingly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. So, and mm -hmm. yeah. And, but also I have a lot of opinions too, right? I mean, like a lot of, a lot of people ask me, uh, like, can you write about this? Can you create, um, you know, uh, can you create content off of this? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, like, can you create content on web scraping, for example, mm -hmm. right? And I'll think about it and the answer is no, I'm not gonna do that because if I'm thinking about data science and I'm thinking about what skills are really needed as a data scientist, web scraping mm -hmm. is not one of them. I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. it's If you really wanna collect data to analyze it, grab yeah. it from an API. That's probably yeah. like the number one way, right? Nobody, nobody like in industry, I've worked at several companies, nobody in industry, like scrapes off the web to collect data. That's illegal, first of all, to do. So like it's either you're connecting to a database that the company owns and you're grabbing it off mm -hmm. that, or you're connecting to an API to get like um, outside company data to analyze yourself. So mm -hmm. how about we learn those you know, techniques mm -hmm. and I'll write about it um, and mm -hmm. I'll give you as much information as possible um, because I feel like maybe that person's um, you know, question behind the question is really how can I learn how to collect data? And so that, mm. that's my that's my opinion on it and my spin on it right. is to teach you how to you know collect from APIs versus web scraping. So it's yeah, stuff yeah, like that, I guess. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Not to say web scraping is like a bad skill to have, but I think like there are there are better ones to have. First, <laughs> maybe learn the right. API stuff and, and then we'll learn web scraping later. Right. I mean, like the companies are sharing the the data through the API officially, right? So mm -hmm. why go through the hassle of having to scrape it from an unstructured, trying to make it structured? Yeah, and and you, I mean, and then there's a lot, and all of the stuff on websites, they're all IP, like owned by, the IP is owned by those companies. So you scraping mm -hmm. it is actually illegal. Mm -hmm. um, so for startups, maybe it doesn't matter, right? Like you just you need to do what you need to do to get your start startup off the ground. Uh, but for like working at like major companies, uh, like I work at, like there's no way that would that would be approved by anybody because we can get in mm -hmm. a lot of trouble um, if that right. if they found out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. So perhaps I think maybe the audiences are wondering like, how does a day in the life looks like for you? Because like you're, you're managing four endeavors at the same time. How, how do you manage all of that? Yeah, what does a typical day look that's, like? that's a great question. So um, my day, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through maybe like one of the tougher days where I touch every single one of my like projects or endeavors. So I typically wake up, um, you know, like at six in the morning, because um, be I, I work full time at, at a company in the US, but my company is international. So oftentimes there are global calls uh, with um, either um, teams in India or teams in Europe. And so I, like my meetings can start around 7 a.m. or eight o'clock in the morning. But I try to do strata scratch stuff in the at least an hour before my my first uh, meeting at at my company so like 6 a.m might be the time i do some strategy scratch stuff do an hour of that 
and then I'm doing uh, my full time work um, um, at at the a company that I'm at right now. Um, I don't touch any of my other work, any Strata Scratch or any professor stuff um, until I finish that. So that's typically, it could be like seven to five o'clock. It could be like nine to five o'clock, but it's it's very consistent there. The day mm-hmm. in the life of that is really just a ton of meetings. <laughs> um, the, I don't get to code as much anymore, really. If, if I do code, it's really reviewing code. And then talking about like the nuances and how somebody should approach these um, these uh, projects or these analyses. Uh, so reviewing that, talking about the nuances about about that, and getting like pretty deep into the code and into the insights. Um, sometimes I'm also um, uh, writing up requirements for another project. So I have another analysis that I want to kick off. I'll write down all the requirements of that and I'll talk to a team to explain, this is what I want out of it. And this is, I feel like with the data, what you can get out of it. And these are the trade-offs, right? And so this is Mm -hmm. what we need to watch out for. So I'll do a lot of that. Um, And there's a lot of stakeholder engagement and handholding. I work Mm -hmm. with the marketing teams, the sales teams, um, um, product brand teams. So we're always trying to like get our um, be in the on the same page with each other, uh, even though we're on we have different perspectives, right? And I feel that um, as a even when I was a data scientist, that's still this that was my day it was really like mm-hmm. collaborating with stakeholders that have different uh, responsibilities than you, uh, different projects and different opinions and perspectives. Mm-hmm. So I right. uh, even so now even as like a product management uh, strategist, like I still do all, like a lot of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so after I'm done around five o'clock, um, I then start. I do a little bit more strata scratch stuff. So you can say like five to six thirty, and then six thirty to ten is when uh, if I have to teach a class, and I teach maybe once or twice in the week that weekdays. Um, I do that. So it's six to, mm. to 10. And I, because like everybody's work from home now, it's actually nice to get, I don't have to commute as much. So I get mm-hmm. even more hours, but mm-hmm. like I, on the toughest days, we're talking about like, yes, yeah, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. On mm-hmm. the best days, it's maybe like 7 a.m. to 6. So what is that? Um, yeah, like 11 hours. It's It's not terrible. I'm just kind of used mm-hmm. to it now. Um, and on the weekends, I try to do maybe like, um, a total of five to 10 hours of strata scratch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. That's my life. Have you ever felt like a bit like lazy for strata scratch? Maybe because like, for example, you're full time working probably on some days. I mean, it might be a bit difficult to manage all of that. Have you ever yeah. felt like that burnout feeling? Yeah. Um, you know, I can't say I can't say I have felt burnout. It's because mm-hmm. I, I really enjoy Strata Scratch a lot, mm-hmm. and so you know, um, a lot of it is actually it could be like fr- more for me like frustration that things are not progressing as fast as mm-hmm. they should be. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I I am lucky to have a pretty good team where I I have like some marketing people, some people uh, that help with the technical content that we create and like mm-hmm. um, talk to the users and help answer their questions. Mm-hmm. And then I have uh, one or two uh, software developers that help like do the pro- uh, engage with the product and make it better. Um, mm-hmm. And so my, my goal is always to create these systems as you're building a business, uh, you're creating these uh, self-running systems where I don't actually need to go in and Mm. um, make decisions or identify problems or anything like that, where I can be more on the high level end, higher level end and think about like, where does this product need to go, right? Like what is the next direction? What is the next milestone for this product? And it allows me to then go back to engage in the community talk to everybody that's using Strata Scratch, talk to people that are not using Strata Scratch. Um, mm-hmm. And that's kind of like where I get a lot of the fulfillment is like really um, talking to people and seeing like what's 
what's troubling their lives as they kind mm -hmm. of um, start their career in data science or in analytics um, to understand where their frustrations are. Then mm -hmm. I take that back and I think about what we can build next in the mm -hmm. next like six months. Like I build the product roadmap off of that. And I actually build the content uh, that I want to write or create YouTube videos off based mm -hmm. off of that too. Um, and yeah. yeah, and so a lot of it is really because all the users of Strash Guides, the majority of them are just beginning their career, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think back to when we were just beginning our careers, there was, there's was just, we didn't, I, at least I didn't know what to do. I was always confused and I was always trying to like find some advice or some mentor that, that was older than me that really um, kind of had some experience like stories from their from their days of like also trying mm -hmm. to get through it um i feel that i've kind of exited out from that like the the entry level phase right and so i do have some thoughts and opinions that that i feel like i could help people with and so i try to do that as much as possible and learn what their new frustrations are right yeah, yeah so, so i don't so i get that yeah. yeah. Oh, I was going to just conclude. I don't yeah. feel burnout. Um, mm -hmm. I feel that the product is not progressing fast enough mm -hmm. a lot of times. And that's right. where my um, frustrations are. I have two years oh. of roadmap already built out uh, mm -hmm. and I want to build it out um, as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's very interesting how your um, like, like, for example, like, I mean, my takeaway would be like your YouTube channel could be like your marketing and as you have mentioned, and it allows you to engage with the community, allows you to know like what what is the, the content that the community wants or need. And then based off, out of that, and you, you, you would then, you know, like maybe feed that content back to Strata Scratch, right? And then you have a team who's managing like the day to day and yeah, so that, that's, that's a very awesome system that you have built. Yeah, yeah. I wish I can scale it up. You know, I mean, when I told you my day to day, like I'm not able to spend like a full eight hours on Strata Scratch every single day. But like, mm -hmm. I wish like one day I'm able to because then I'd be able to get that system that we just talked about even more mm -hmm. scaled up. Right mm -hmm. now, it's one YouTube every two weeks, you know, at best, because as you know yourself, these videos, uh, even though they're like five minutes, 15 minutes long, they take hours and hours to make. Right. You're writing the script, that takes hours. You're filming it, it takes hours. And then you're editing it, it takes editing more hours. It. And it's right. just like, it's hard to do it every mm -hmm. single week consistently. And I think you you have several out every week, not just one a week, I think, right? From what I've seen on so yeah. Yeah. So I'm aiming for at least two videos a week, but then like some, some weeks are very challenging. So I, I had to like, you know, like down, down into like one video a week. Yeah. And there were, there were some weeks where like during the initial phases of pandemic where like I didn't have to commute. So more time for YouTube. So, I mean, I would be able to try to make it like every other day and then you know, like to, just to experiment, like would that improve like the viewership or the uh, incoming subscriber of the channel? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, but the, all of that takes so, like you have a full-time job too. So it just might right, right. take so long, uh, so many hours to do. And I mean, yeah. we're do, we're filming right now. It's like 1030 on a Saturday uh, <laughs> over where you are. And it's, uh, yeah. it's 830 in the morning where I am too on a Saturday. Mm. So it's, it's just like there's no there's no weekends. It's just always right. like on and yeah yeah it's tough. Yeah, so I, I mean I, I would have to say similar to your um, for Strata Scratch, it's like like for myself operating this YouTube channel, it's like it's like a passion project. So like maybe like my wife would ask like, do you get tired? I mean she would see me like editing the videos and all that. And I'm like I don't feel tired. I mean although I mean physically tired, but then you know like mentally, I mean never tired because yeah, there's always right. new things to learn you know new friends to to meet and talk to it's yeah. pretty engaging yeah i agree so much with what you just said yeah it's a it's it's a passion pro project like we don't need to do this um and so it's just because we like to and um i think also like just the people that engage out and reach out to you probably and to me via comments or via linkedin uh whatever other 
channels there are to reach out, they're always very positive. And I think that mm -hmm. also helps a lot uh, with any any burnout that you might experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So like based out of your um, running Strata Scratch for the past four years, like um, what are some of the essential skill sets that recruiters are looking for uh, in order to land a role as a data scientist? Yeah, <clears throat> no, that's a great question. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult uh, to answer. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I think the first reason why is that the interview process as a data scientist, for a day as a data scientist, there, it's different by company. Um, and there's two reasons why. The first reason is because people are still trying to figure out or companies are tr still trying to figure out what skill sets they actually need for um, to hire a data scientist. What like, like do we need them to be able to uh, code in a certain language? Is that important? Do we need them to understand um, algorithms and software development skills? to be able to also be like a little bit more full stack. Um, and so that that could be, that's a reason why you're seeing like a different landscape now than what you probably saw five years ago, just a completely different skill set that's needed. Two is different companies um, view data scientists as, as just kind of um, different. So a data scientist at Amazon and Netflix is actually different than what Facebook might call a different uh, data scientist which is different than um, what any other company outside of tech would call a data scientist. So it's different technologies that would sort of inform you on what skill sets you need as a data scientist, um, how fast the, uh, that industry like works, right? And like tech is like, you're always kind of pumping out the next version of the platform, right? And so like being full stack and be able to like deploy experiments yourself as a data scientist is incredibly valuable. Um, so that maybe is why like Netflix would require you to understand, you know, like um, how, how to act, be a software developer in addition to being a data scientist. And, and, um, and then the business model also is very different and it will inform you like what sort of skills you need as a data scientist, right? So that's kind of like my caveat to say, it's really hard to say, uh, but mm -hmm. what I've seen in, in like, like now, um, in this day and age, um, obviously, like coding is a big is a big one. Like that's just that's entry level. That's how you get in, right? And data science is not uh, an entry level position. Most people uh, need to have a few few years experience as a data analyst before actually going into uh, a role as a data scientist. And it's really because understanding how to code coding it in the right way uh, and, and managing and manipulating large sets of data is actually very difficult for anybody just coming outside of school. There's a, there's a way industry does it that you need to understand before going into data science. So mm -hmm. that is why like, yeah, Python, R, SQL um, is all sort of like necessary to understand as uh, entry level data scientists or data analysts. Um, but more importantly, how you actually solve these problems that they have and think about it. The, the think about it, thinking about it is very important. And then another skill set to have that I feel like um, a lot of people kind of like they don't think about until it's maybe too late. Mm -hmm. Really, um, the softer skills, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's not only collaborating with people, um, communicating effectively with people. But it's really like, how do you think about your recommendation? So you built a model. It's awesome that you were able to get like 99% accuracy with whatever model you used. But what does that actually mean um, to the business, for the project? Uh, what, what the, how does that translate to anything positive, right? Like, were you able, able to add more users? Were you able to identify more users? We're able to increase revenue in a certain way. You need to make that bridge um, and you need to be able, and in order to do that, you need to be able to communicate well with different stakeholders across different departments 
that have different perspectives because not everybody's technical and nobody really will care about your F score, you know, when you're building models. And so you need to be able to have that. And I feel like a lot of people, that's what they struggle with because they're so deep into the code. Um, mm -hmm. Softer skills, I would say, obviously coding skills that include machine learning and all of that. That's, that's really big. Another big section is uh, statistics. I think that is like knowing like what a random forest does in the back end and how that could bias some of your um, insights and outputs based off of the data that you're putting in uh, and being able to explain that to both somebody technical and not technical is a really tough skill to have also. Um, and we talked earlier in this podcast about, you know, back in my day, you would be building the algorithms from scratch so that um, you know exactly the math behind it. I think in this day and age where it's so easy to ramp up a machine learning model in five lines of code using a Python function, people really lose that. Um, and so, right. you know, it's very important to be able to understand exactly what is going on. Um, <laughs> so... How do you get there, right? I think a lot of people are always at least asking me, like, how do you get there? You just explained, like, three things that would take 10 years uh, to learn. Um, I think the, the way to get there is really, like, uh, engaging in communities. So, like, I love, like, the Reddit community, um, uh, just the, the data science, not only the data science community, machine learning community, but all of the adjacent communities. Um, I know the YouTube... Uh, community that pe where people talk about analytics and data science. Um, it's, it's actually surprisingly small, a small community, but it's very engaging. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of people are on it. Um, and then once you have a, a community to kind of like, you know, talk with and doing projects um, and implementing everything you're learning is, is you'll learn a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you get your first job, I think that's where you'll realize um, how much you don't know and you can right. then progress and learn more uh, once you get your first job. But getting your first job is always so hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, yeah. So actually I was about to ask you another question would be like, which area do you think aspiring data scientists have trouble in? So you briefly touched upon that topic about like being able to have the soft skill, uh, being able to explain the model and not to be too deep into the code, but then to move out and uh, to engage in the the answer as well. Yeah, I would say that is the toughest. And <clears throat> it's really just through my experience, you know, I've managed a lot of data scientists um, and I interview for my company and previous companies I, I was at, I interviewed uh, candidates to be part of the data science team. and. The biggest thing, like I, I never, the, obviously there were people that I, I felt like didn't know like um, the math behind things or even how to code. But like, aside from that, 90% of the candidates come in, they have the technical skills. That is not a mm -hmm. problem. It's really about uh, how they're explaining their solution to me. And it's mm -hmm. really about when they're talking about a project and I'm like trying to double click into something or dive deeper into something. I'm asking like, hey, why did you choose this um, model? You say, you, you choose um, like a clustering model. Why did you choose that? And then they give me an answer. I'm like, okay, but but then how did you validate that it was it was the right model to choose, like to pick? I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, but then can you tell me like, what are the, you know, um, how, what tests did you use to validate that? Okay, great. What was the, um, What's, what is the, like, not necessarily what's the equation for that uh, that test, but, like, what does that test really get you? And what are the trade-offs with the data that you're using? So I'm, like, diving deep, deep, and deep. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really, it gets really hard to explain, right? Like, why you're doing what you're doing. And I think that is, if you can actually be able to explain everything you're doing to somebody that's also that's not in the weeds with you that are maybe technical, but like just mm -hmm. that wasn't there when you were coding. So this doesn't really know why you're doing what you're doing. Um, right. You will go far that like somebody that is um, technically brilliant at that, able to explain and communicate to both technical and non-technical people 
and is just has a positive attitude mm -hmm. um, and seems passionate about their subject will have a successful career. There's, there's no doubt about it because there, it, like I interview a lot of people and I would say like communication and passion and like enthusiasm, they're not always there. But mm -hmm. the ability to code, like a lot of people have that, and that's not the problem right. for most people. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and like while you're, you're, I mean, as a role and as a recruiter, um, I mean, you, you could probably detect that passion and um, enthusiasm for data off the bat. And was that like a major criteria for hiring or do you have other parameters as well? Yeah, it's not like a written major parameter, like they need to mm -hmm. have enthusiasm, but, it makes the interview more positive, right? Like the interview right. is gonna be like an hour, sometimes they're much longer than that. So if if I'm struggling to engage this person, um, I'm just like not gonna be engaged either. And it's easier right. for me just to write like, you know, a pass for this guy mm -hmm. just because, you know, it's it's not, it's it wasn't a great interview. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But also like I always ask myself is, um, Am I gonna like working with this person? Is my team mm -hmm. gonna like working with this person? And this, mm -hmm. and if this person, this first time I meet meet them, doesn't have any enthusiasm at all, the, my team and I are not gonna like it. And that's mm -hmm. sort of like, at least for me, the biggest um, factor that I have when hiring is is that question because mm -hmm. um, you can really ruin somebody's day just by working with a crappy per like teammate, right? Mm -hmm. It's just that's mm -hmm. the thing, like. Uh, it's so hard to motivate people. It's so hard to like find really good people to work for. So, right. um, so like I, I am at least myself. I'm very picky, especially in mm. that criteria. Um, other things. I think your question was like, are there other things that I look for? Um, I think like what I said, just being able to explain uh, your projects that you've done in the past and really understand um, why you did what you did uh, what is, is a major um, kind of skill set that I look for. And really like, if you think about how long an interview lasts, you really need to only get through like two projects at most, um, depending on how many questions that, you know, that, um, that I would ask. So it's not like I'm asking you like, describe a project from 10 years ago, I'm like, I'm asking you describe a project that you're working on right now. You should be able to tell me kind of the the details behind it in a in a concise manner. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are the two biggest skill sets that that we look for, for right. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. So I think we just ran out of questions, and I mean, I really enjoyed the discussion that we're having right now. And yeah, probably I would love to have another discussion with you maybe in the future as well. And so um, would you like to tell us like how can we find you on, on YouTube or on, yeah. on the website? Yeah, absolutely. Like, it, yeah, I would love to have another conversation with you diving in, into other parts of, you know, data science or, or career or anything. Um, but yeah, you can find me, uh, my channel, uh, it's, it's called Nate at Stratascratch. Uh, and then all of my blog articles are on the Stratascratch uh, website, stratascratch.com. Uh, that's where the platform is, um, and that's where all the blog articles are. And then my email is also there. Um, but the email is nate at stratascratch.com. So you can always uh, email there with any questions that you have. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a big pleasure. And the links to the website as well as, as the blog website as well. So they're also going to be provided in the video description uh, of this video. And so, yeah, thanks, Nate, for being on the podcast and hope to have you soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. Thank you for watching until the end of this video. And also, please subscribe to Nate's channel and I'll provide you the link in the video description. And if you're finding value in this video, please smash the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and make sure to hit on the notification bell so that you'll be notified of the next video. And as always, the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And please enjoy the journey.